Hey guys, Andy here with CQE Academy and I am so excited for this week's video. Again, we're sticking with the theme where we're talking about new topics being added to the CQE body of knowledge. And as you know, a big part of that update was all about risk management. So I wanted to talk about one of the new topics within risk management, which is all about risk treatment strategies. All right, let's head over to the computer and get started. All right, let's take a look at today's agenda. Like I mentioned, we're covering the uh, new topic in the CQE body of knowledge, and I've shown the body of knowledge here. This is the kind of the updated version of risk management in the CQE body of knowledge, and one of the new topics are four risk treatment strategies that you need to be aware of to be successful on the CQE exam. Now, what is a risk treatment strategy? Essentially, it's the process of modifying risk. Now, that's kind of a vague term because that could be the reduction or the lowering or the eliminating of risk. So we use this really vague term. Now, there are four specific strategies that you can use, and that's what we're going to cover today. And in fact, this is the order we're going to talk about it in. Avoiding risk, mitigating risk, transferring risk, and then ultimately accepting risk. Let's go ahead and jump in and get started. Okay, so strategy number one is all about avoiding risk. Now, risk avoidance, and I love this definition, is an informed decision. That's an important aspect. It's an informed decision not to be involved in or to withdraw from an activity in order to avoid exposure to a particular risk. Now, risk avoidance in terms of quality professionals can also look like eliminating or removing the risk source. And, and this is where we get back to this idea of prevention. If you can prevent a failure mode from ever occurring, you're essentially going to avoid any exposure to that failure mode in the future. And so this is quite frankly, the number one strategy that you should use as a quality engineer to treat your risk. And that's all about risk avoidance through things like preventative action. Now, we also use risk avoidance in our everyday life. So for example, we don't swim in a pool when there's lightning. If you're swimming and there's lightning, that changes the risk associated with being in the pool. And we avoid that risk by simply just getting out of the pool. So that's just one, one quick example. The other thing is if it's snowing or if there's a lot of ice on the roads, we close the roads. We avoid the risk of driving on an icy road by closing the road. And that's another way we use of risk avoidance in our everyday life. In business, oftentimes businesses don't engage in a legal activity to avoid risk. They make an informed decision not to be involved in a legal activity because that activity comes with certain business risk or financial risk or compliance risk, whatever word you want to use, you can avoid that risk by simply just making an informed decision not to be involved in an illegal activity. If we go back to the quality example, the reason we design robust products, right, is, is so that we can avoid failures and essentially eliminate or avoid the risk associated with those failures. This is why design and prevention specifically is so incredibly important because we want to we be able to avoid all the risks associated with those failure modes. The same thing is true for a robust process. In fact, this is the value of Six Sigma. If we can create a Six Sigma process, essentially we're going to attempt to eliminate all of the defects associated with that process. And by doing so, we're avoiding both those failures and the risk associated with those failures. So risk avoidance is a really important thing to think about and consider as one of your risk treatment strategies. The next strategy is probably the second most common, and this is called mitigating risk. Now, the definition of risk mitigation essentially means reducing either the likelihood of occurrence or the severity of a risk event. Now, this all goes back to the definition of risk. If you're trying to quantify the risk associated with any sort of event, there are two factors that you need to consider when, again, quantifying risk. The first is the likelihood or the probability of occurrence. And the second factor that we use when we're thinking about risk is all about the severity of that event. And so when you're mitigating risk, you can attack either one of those factors. So for example, something that we're all familiar with is COVID. When we were in the COVID pandemic, there were a lot of things that we did that where we attempted to reduce the likelihood of occurrence of contracting COVID. We washed our hands. We avoided physical contact. We wore masks. We did all the social distancing. The reason we did that was to reduce the likelihood that you were going to contract COVID. And in doing so, we were mitigating the risk associated with COVID by going after the probability of occurrence. And so as a quality engineer, that's one thing that you can do too. If you're aware of a, a particular failure mode, implement strategies that reduce the likelihood of occurrence. And by doing so, you're mitigating the risk. Now, that's only one half of the equation. The other side of the equation is all about severity, okay? So you can also implement corrective actions or you can mitigate risk by reducing severity. 
Now, the example I always love to give is all about protective equipment. I love sports. I love uh, playing sports and attending sports events. And so oftentimes in sports, people wear protection, right? You see helmets, you see pads. And the point of, of that strategy is to reduce the severity of an impact. Sometimes in sports, you cannot avoid a collision. And when a collision does occur, one of the things we can do to prevent injuries is to simply reduce the severity of that. And we do so through things like uh, helmets and stuff. The other real life example that I really love is airbags. An airbag is intended to reduce the severity or the impact to the end user if a crash does occur. Your airbags don't change the, the probability of occurrence of you getting into a car crash. But when a crash occurs, we can drastically reduce the, the impact or the severity of that event by having airbags in our car. So when you're thinking about mitigating risk, again, don't forget you can go after the, the probability of occurrence or you can also try to reduce the severity. So that's mitigating risk. The next risk treatment strategy is all about transferring risk. Sometimes risk can be transferred to a third party, okay? And the best example of this is insurance. Insurance is a vehicle out there that allows you to transfer risk. In fact, in your personal life, you have a lot of risks, right? A disaster, which could be a fire, a hurricane, a flood, could destroy your home. And we mitigate that risk through things like home insurance or life insurance or health insurance or car insurance or flood insurance or even identity theft insurance. And the way an insurance policy works is you pay for that policy and then you're able to transfer that risk to an insurance company, right? Now, transferring risk isn't free. That insurance policy obviously costs you money every month. But if an event were to occur, right, if there was some, some serious event, the financial risk associated with that event would fall on the insurance company, not you, right? You've transferred that risk to a third party. The other vehicle out there that people often use to transfer risk is the idea of a futures contract. So let's say your company and your major raw material is wheat. You, you're a food producer and, you, and wheat is your biggest raw material. If you were to analyze risks to your business, you could you could look out in the future and go, hey, if the price of wheat were to drastically increase, that would be a significant business risk. Our profit margins might fall to zero if the price of wheat were to drastically increase. And this is where futures contracts can help you transfer risk to a third party. You can go out and you can buy a futures contract that basically says, hey, in the future, in six months or nine months or 12 months, I want to pay a certain price for wheat. You want to lock in the price of wheat by buying a futures contract. So in the future, right, I've got this contract where in the future I'm going to buy wheat at a fixed price. And by, by purchasing this future contract, you can transfer the risk that the price of wheat might change again to a third party. Now, this works both on, for the buyer and for the seller. Let's say you're a farmer and you're growing wheat and the season just started and you planted your wheat and you know that in six months or nine months or whatever, that wheat is going to be ready to harvest and you're going to want to sell it. Now, as a businessman, you know that if the price of wheat falls, you're not going to have a profitable year. You're not going to be able to pay for your equipment. You're not going to be able to pay for your labor. And so you can transfer that risk through the use of a futures contract. You can essentially sell a futures contract that says, hey, in the future, I want to sell you know, a thousand bushels of wheat at $400 a piece, and you can lock in that price and essentially say, hey, I know that in the future, I'm going to have the money I need to have to, to pay my employees to buy all this equipment and to essentially be a profitable business through the use of a futures contract. I'm actually showing the, the price of, of wheat futures here on the screen because the, the war in Ukraine had a major impact on wheat. Ukraine is a major exporter of wheat, and the fact that we had a war in Ukraine drastically changed the business risk surrounding wheat. And what a lot of companies did is they went out and they attempted to mitigate that business risk, right, that increased risk through a futures contract. And what that did is it drove up the price of futures contracts. So again, the two ways to transfer risk are insurance policies and futures contracts. Okay, let's move on now to the fourth and final uh, risk treatment strategy. And this is all about risk acceptance. Now, before I talk about accepting risk, there's a new term that you have to know, and this is all about residual risk. Residual risk is defined as the, the risk that remains after all your risk treatment strategies are applied. Think about a PFMEA. You've identified all these failure modes, you've quantified the severity, the occurrence, and the detection, 
and you've gone through the CAPA process, you've attempted to improve your process and reduce the likelihood, but at the end of the day, there will still be some level of risk that remains uh, after all your, your treatments are applied. I love this, this picture here because any product or process always has some level of inherent risk. And what we do as quality professionals is we take that inherent risk and we start applying risk treatments. We start to mitigate that risk. Now, after we've applied all those risk treatments, there is some level of residual risk. This is an important concept. No product or no service or no process is inherently risk-free. That, that does not exist. Everything has some level of residual risk. And so the idea of risk acceptance is an informed decision to accept residual risk. I love that phrase, informed decision, because before you accept your risk, you have to quantify it, right? You have to understand the residual risk that exists, and that has to be an informed decision to accept that residual risk that's incredibly important. And that's this idea of risk acceptance. Now, that's not where risk management ends, right? Once you've accepted your residual risk, you should be monitoring and reviewing your risk over time to make sure that your risk levels don't change. In fact, if we go back to the CQE body of knowledge, the very next topic in the body of knowledge is risk monitoring. So once you've quantified your residual risk, you should monitor that risk over time through things like complaint tracking and trending, post-market surveillance, call it whatever you want, but that's essentially your obligation as a quality professional is to monitor risk over time to try to confirm that if your residual risk uh, has uh, changed over time. Now, of course, we're not going to cover that today. We cover that all in the course, the CQE Masterclass, but today I just wanted to cover those four main strategies. If you want to learn more and continue growing, head over to cqeacademy.com. I have a ton of free resources to help you prepare for the exam. In fact, I'll link all those in the description below. I've got uh, practice exams. I've got study guides. I've got cheat sheets. I've got equation guides, all sorts of stuff to help you prepare. I also have a completely free course. Head over to cqeacademy.com slash free course. It's the top 10 topics on the CQ exam, videos, practice exams, and all sorts of downloadable stuff to, again, help you prepare for the exam and be successful on exam day. And if you're, if you're really serious about becoming a CQE, check out the CQE Masterclass. I put in a ton of effort and time making that the absolute best product out there to helping you clear the CQ exam. And if you like this video, do me a favor, hit that like button. That way other people just like you can find this. And again, if you want to stay on that journey to become a CQE, hit that subscribe button. That way, as I publish these weekly videos, especially around this new content on the CQE exam, you get notified and you can stay on that video and continue learning and continue growing. And I would love to have you be a part of the tribe. And uh, leave a comment down below if you have any questions, and I will be in touch. Thanks so much. Bye.